Right, I can't take it any longer. Georgina's given us a juicy question, so let's pop off chat. Siri will start the alarm in a few minutes. Um, Georgina, ask us your question. I uh, got to, um, how will you ensure that your tutors are using learning tools efficiently to ensure effective tutoring? And everything that comes to mind feels a little bit like I'm hovering over them and being an unpleasant manager who's wanting to correct them awesome. um, or being creepy and diving into their lessons, which I don't really want to do. So I've not found a balance that feels really comfortable for me. I, I, I'm going to open the question out to the group in a second. I just want to point out two things. Firstly, there are two branches on this audit. So Georgina is on the tutor business track. Um, and Dee, you're probably on the individual tutors track. Um, and so Nicola, you'll also be doing the same track as Georgina, won't you? So what are your thoughts about how to, um, how to not micromanage and yet to ensure that they have what they need to be doing the right the best, their best possible work. Um, I think using the phrase sharing best practice helps rather than saying, I'm going to come in and check if you're doing X and Y. Um, and sort of asking the question, what do you feel has been useful or what tools have you used with a particular student and how can that be cross transferred? to other tutors who work with students of the same age, maybe doing the same qualification, and how you can put that in a bucket and share it. Hmm. I like that. Ask them what they feel is going well. Yeah, and if they say nothing, then they need some help. <laughs> yes, and then you can suggest, well, I had a go with this with this student, and it works in this way because, um, and, sort of providing an area I'm sure you've got shared folders where there's resources and other bits you can bob into has she ever <laughs> the queen of spreadsheets and files <laughs> definitely um I think that's that's really helpful to bob in and out of um and also I think giving them an opportunity to talk about things when you're not there um I know it, you know you want to be part of it and you want there to be some kind of feedback um but what we're going to try and do next year is team tutors up in pairs. Mm. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we'll do that yet, but it's like a co-coaching system. And so, um, again, it's finding the time that something doesn't take too long to do, finding the opportunity to do it. And it can be via email or it could be, well, I've got 10 minutes. We're both free this lunchtime. Let's drop in. Um, and finding a way of trying to collate that as well um, is useful. But I think having the conversation is probably the most important thing to begin with and then kind of moving on from there. I like that, because this is uh, this is kind of what I was thinking as you were sharing, sharing your suggestion to talk to them about what they're doing. I feel like if I go in and say how things are going, they're just going to go, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if they were talking to each other, they would, they would share what's not great. <laughs> yes, yes. And then hopefully you can pick back up on that, whether there can be a lead person who asks the other people and then they feed back to you. Um, mm. and in sort of smaller group situations um, and uh, I mean one of the things I've been trying to do this year with my sort of half hour fortnightly meetings was to hand over to different people for different sessions but we found that in actual fact I was doing quite a lot of housekeeping then I wanted to do 10 minutes on a particular topic of something just to upskill a little bit um, and we ran out of time so I think trying to find an additional time to put that in you've got to then have the conversation of cost benefit are you then paying people for that time is it included in the tuition package the tuition fee because obviously you're not just paid for time that you have that one-to-one -one with the students um it's the emails before the emails after the planning what have you what is in that package and does that involve um what what, what does that involve and just having it very clear what is involved with that uh, and so I don't use the phrase hourly rate. I use a tutor fee um, and what's sort of within that fee. Um, and that I found that's quite a useful language to use. Mm. That helps. <laughs> it's really intentional, that approach, isn't it? And it all follows right through. I wonder whether um, you could move the housekeeping to a self-paced 
delivery. Um, somebody just shared a Loom recording with me because we weren't able to do a meeting. Um, and I think that that's a really um, interesting way to be able to share screen, say what you need to, don't have to script it, don't even have to type it, um, but they don't necessarily have to show up. So you're not taking, the, you, you, they, can, they can access it in their own time is that point, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I certainly, when I, in my school, um, I inherited a meeting process that was all about the housekeeping. Um, and the minute that I gave them that time back and found a different way to get the information to them, I, they, they felt like I'd given them time back. And that's like the best thing you can do for an educator, right? Um, Andrea, are you back with us? I can see you're doing the Zoom dance, but you made a suggestion in the chat that I'd love to hear. Is Andrea back with us, Hannah? I am. I am. Hello, Hello. Dolly. Go ahead. I'm in and out with bad signal. Um, yeah, I think anything dialogic. So looking, I think basically it was. It's kind of already been said, but the idea about asking, you know, sort of, or having a suggestion of best practice, and said, "Oh, what have you been using? Perhaps with that, have you found any of those useful?" So it becomes like a bit of a, a dialogue in in how those are being used, as opposed to just the didactic tools that you should use because obviously you've got people that are either working for you or you're working yourself and you kind of know what works so I think sometimes it's easy to have in that conversation with others if you're in a sort of an organization or with other independent people as well that what's what's worked for you and discussing different types of um you know of approaches so it does become conversational rather than something that's enforced really there's there's a lot here in terms of leadership skills isn't there um, and um, I'm really, really curious how much is about the relationship that you have with your tutors and how much of that is defined by which kind of tutors you are taking on. So I know that you're working with science graduates, professional scientists, Georgina, and then Nicola, you're working, are you working with undergrads? Did you say that before? Yeah, a combination, a graduate right. and undergrad, yeah. Right, and then do we have anybody in the room who's employing um qualified teachers okay because that's a whole nother um blend again of relationships isn't it um and it becomes quite complicated um making balancing get it getting the hang of that relationship is pretty defining isn't it um and when it unravels it's really difficult because we started off this query by georgina saying I'm just trying to help them get the right stuff, but I'm worried they'll resent it. Jade, welcome. It's really nice to see you. Hi. Um, so currently we're working on the international tutoring framework. And I think next time we pause, I'm going to ask one of the independent tutors to jump in um, and tell us how that's working for you guys. Are you okay with going back to it for another five or 10 minutes now? Seeing if you can make some more progress? Of course, you can flick all the way through the questions if it helps you to get a shape in your mind of where you're going. And then you can come back because the whole document is completely editable. You can move back and forth at your own time. OK, where are we up to? <laughs> where are we up to? Which of the independent tutors would like to share some of the insights that are coming up for them? I think mine is just, it was nice to see because obviously I did something very similar to this before getting accredited. But even in that short space of time, how much has changed? For the better, I should probably say. So there's a lot more and there's a lot more I've thought about potentially without even realising till now. Huh. So that was positive for me. That's blinding. Can you give us an example, please? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that was raised to my attention was that I have I've got a business network, but I didn't really have any support within the tutoring space. I wasn't using it to the best of my ability. So I think just showing up a bit more on that front, um, probably also working with schools as well. It's something that I've never done before. Um, I've done maybe workshops or whatever, but I've done it through a medium where it's through a club or through something that I've maybe helped out with, but never actually for tutoring, if you like. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got a new partnership with a local school starting in August. So that's fantastic. So it says things like that that you think, right, well, fast forward three months, a lot can change. So I think it's a good thing to put things into perspective and remind yourself that you are. There's a lot changed. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and also it makes me think of that measurable progress element that just having this resource, you know, you can use this resource as, as often as is healthy, not too often. Um, but you can you can come back to this, you know, quarterly and give yourself a chance to just see what looks different now. Um, Jeremy, I'm really struck by your statement that you that that working with schools is something you always want to do more of. Um I wonder whether there's something that you could be doing more or differently that you could pick up from the colleagues here to lean into that. Um, I I talk to schools with letters and phone calls and things like that, but not regularly kind of, I think having a link with a school would be just really helpful because the curriculum does change, not as much as maybe it could, but um, may, maybe as much as people think it changes. I think the basic skills are still there, but I still feel, even though I don't want to be in a school, I really feel it would be valuable to talk to schools, always have done. So I want a good open relationship with them. So So there's two elements there. There's the there's the knowledge base and yeah. there's the relationship for getting work. Mostly, those- the knowledge, mostly the knowledge base. Mostly the knowledge base. I, I've I've got plenty of work. It's yeah, it's more the knowledge. Okay. Um, and are there schools? Are there so? Uh, are you suggesting that you'd like to join insects in schools? Um, possibly, but just have a link that I could ask questions. Is when something comes up and the child says I don't do it that way at school, then I like ah. to know what that way is and if it's changed. And usually it hasn't. It's just that the teachers find a shortcut, but it, it's just good to discuss it with a professional. Because I, I have you, are you, Yeah. I have done that. So. Yeah. So we're talking about a curriculum lead. We're talking about a subject lead, maybe. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. That's really interesting. That's a new idea. I've not. Could be a rebellious teacher, though. <laughs> could be a rebellious teacher who's, who's sneaking you the inside yeah. track. <laughs> the other thing it could be is one of us here who's you know either also still working in school or pretty confident in that specific yeah. area um yeah. so maybe that maybe you know, initially I thought that what you'd said in the chat was that you like more work in schools no I've uh, done that yeah, right? yeah. I'm glad <laughs> but, to be out of that uh-huh oh that's but interesting that, that doesn't mean I wouldn't want to do group work as a tutor so yeah anybody started with group work recently we had a conversation about that just before, didn't we? Um, that's so, what yeah. part of that's what part of my link with the school will be. So it will be small, sort of eight to ten pupil workshops and things like that. So for me, that will be new. But I'm mm-hmm. more than happy to sort of share, you know, within the community of what comes out of that. Because my idea was to kind of document it for myself. So if people want to know, then you can know. Um, it might be useful for some. That's gorgeously generous. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'm also struck because Georgina said earlier, what did you say about um, about group work? It's like a dark art. I really don't understand how it works. <laughs> it's a dark art. And I said to you, it's like cooking a roast. <laughs> you just have to not burn the potatoes whilst the beans just need a little bit of time and you just have to keep all the plates spinning at the same time to mix the metaphors so that yeah that's exactly right lots of us on here teach groups and Charlotte's certainly the queen of that um I've been thinking as we've been um having our quiet time about those me-shaped holes that we create and how Charlotte's background was very much on the drama side and so running those big groups suited her and Georgina you're much more of the one-to-one and the caring so that it's really, really interesting how we're sort of leaning into our niches. Eleanor, what's showing up for you? Hi. Hi. Um, I'm quite new to all of this. So I only started, I quit teaching in December. was thinking about going in a totally different direction. And then two months in, I just thought, I'll just do a bit of tutoring just to make some money. And then, um, and then really enjoyed it. So I have just got really into it. Um, but because I'm quite new, I've done lots of asking lots of questions on Facebook and stuff like that. But yeah, I um, I'm just kind of 
get like working out what I'm doing really <laughs> so it's a bit <laughs> but, <Whoa>! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty immense yeah so yeah no it's really it's been really good but um so yeah I thought I'd just join in and just that's have it hit, Sorry. you know so yeah I think for me like I said on the memo message it was the whole I mean obviously I think about safeguarding like like something came up this week actually um one of my friends has got a, a her kid is in year 10 and he was she was talking about getting one-to-one tutoring and then I ultimately said oh yeah no, you know you can come over to mine or whatever and then I thought about it and I thought, actually <laughs> really a 10 year old boy in my house when no one else is there um and because I've only tutored one-to-one year 13 students or 18 like until this point and I was like and all my other ones are online and so they you know they're all at home with family there doors open all that kind of stuff so I've thought of that, that kind of thing but I just suddenly dawned on me that ah, I really need to think about that so yeah. and like I've got lots of plans and what to do to make sure that I'm not alone with this child yeah. but but yeah so I haven't really and obviously I've done safeguarding as a teacher loads of it and and some of it very recently only like just before I left but I haven't really thought about the whole doing a proper safeguarding course for tutors. So, so safeguarding for tutors is where all this started, um, mm-hmm. because because knowing what safe looks like with tutoring and building out your own code of conduct, whatever that is for you and suits you, is you have to be really really intentional because nobody's going to spoon feed it to you. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so I think you asked whether or not you can access safeguarding with us and you absolutely can. Um, yeah, I've sent an email already. <laughs> <laughs> it took you so long. Um, but I think, I think what's really, really lovely is this, like, this mindset of, oh, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. And just leaning into that instead of getting panicky and closing that door. Because um, I know exactly what things are stressing me out right now that I haven't asked clearly in my own mind. Do you know what I mean? Things that I haven't dealt with. So we've all got those, those um, icky bits that we don't want to, to address. And I think having safe spaces to, to go through those is exactly the magic. Could you, um, Elena, what's your subject? Chemistry. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, you've, you're in good company here. There's lots of scientists here. <laughs> Um, so are you, where are you guys up to in the audit? I would love some feedback on it when you're getting towards the end. Oh, I, yeah, I finished before, so. Fantastic. Is there anybody else who's still doing it and wants a little bit more time? Or should I leave you to do that in your own time and actually just, I would love to gather some feedback before we wrap up. Would that be all right with you? Okay. So, um, so let's do that. If you are, um, with us, but with screens off, I would love to have the screens on now. Um, cause it's, thank you, Yvonne, cause it's much easier to get, um, reflections and feedback from people when you can see them. Um, did you find that process helpful? Thank you. Could you explain why please? I think I've said this to you before, but there's so many things that I just do and until I think about why I do them or why I do them a particular way, um, I don't really necessarily improve on them, if that makes sense. So if I just kind of deal with something as it comes up and I never really think about what I'm doing, why, I'm probably making myself more work (laughs) and also could probably improve it actually having to answer the question and document and answer really makes me think about what I'm doing Um, and I've actually done this before and having done it there were loads of things that I thought oh yeah how do we do it and I've actually documented made it into a process since so answering it this time was brilliant (laughs) (laughs) oh so you measured your own progress and gave yourself a pat on the back yes awesome iced coffee (laughs) um I, I I really um I don't I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't gone to that event last night I would have had nothing to talk about with you guys today so um so one of the things that Dylan Williams said yesterday was about school leadership and he said before somebody removes something from a system you jolly well have to know why it was put there in the first place right so he used the example that that I think he said this was a a short story from G.K. Chesterton he said Um, a man wanted to remove a fence from a field. And the farmer said, if you can work out why it was there, why it was put there, then you can remove it. But until you understand 
what the thinking was behind putting that fence up, you're not qualified to remove it. So interrogating your own systems, and we're lucky because our systems are light. We've only just made them up, right? Jeremy, you've been creating your systems organically and systematically over the last however many years, and you know what the thinking was behind them. If you inherit a system, like you go into a big school, um, you don't quite know what the thinking was. And sometimes it's just that it suited them on a Wednesday afternoon. And so, you know, sports is always done on a Wednesday afternoon, but now the PE teacher isn't available on a Wednesday afternoon. So understanding the source of ideas is really, really important. So why do I do it like that? And what am I trying to achieve? It's too easy to gloss over because it's much more fun to play with Canva or spreadsheet. <laughs> Natasha, welcome. Have you been doing the ITF with us? Um, hello, I have, hello. yes. And how's it I am, I'm new to tutoring. Welcome. I, I haven't finished teaching yet. I'm um, head of science at a school, a local school, and I have been for many years. Um, and I'm taking the plunge in July and have been doing a bit of tutoring. Um, but um, yes, I'm just here to learn, really, and listen and find out a little bit about how, how it all works. So I'm right at the beginning. And it would be really good to get some advice so I don't feel like I'm starting right at the beginning <laughs> and I can sort of like learn a little bit before I make lots of mistakes along the way. Now I've got a lot of experience and I've really enjoyed the tutoring I've done um, and I haven't done any groups yet or anything like that but I've, you know I've just had a go at it and and you know felt it, it was rewarding and something that I'd like to pursue Um, not quite sure how yet. So hence my my feedback was sort of a bit vague because, you know, I don't really know where I'm going. And, you know, answering those questions were quite difficult, you know, yet. But, you know, I'd like to be part of a wider community so I can learn a bit more. And I couldn't I couldn't start earlier because I was teaching. But, you know, I've joined a little bit later and awesome. I feel like I've missed missed quite a bit. Oh no, like you come in halfway through the movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. If you if you go back to the beginning of this day, you'll know everything because we've really been telling stories today. Um, so welcome. In my mind, what you've just described is putting the cutlery holder in the drawer before you put the cutlery in. So for you, the framework will be knowing that these, you know, you need you need spoons because you've got a spoon space now, yeah? So you need community, you need safe, you know, safer recruitment practices because you've, because you've got this framework now that's empty that you can now start populating, which is a really interesting place to be. Anyone else got any other insights for me? Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, I'm going to give you a break before we have three really really focused half hour sessions and half hour sessions exhaust me because Nicola I was exhausted after your session because because what happens is that the, the delivery is so chock full that there's tons 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 to follow so please take some time to rest now and then we will see you back at Hannah 2 30 yeah 2 30 you've got dyscalculia with an awesome, um, his name's escaped me and I don't have it written in front of me. Robert Jennings. So Robert Jennings and his colleague Kat created um, a Dyscalculia organization and they're so committed. I'm really, really impressed with them. So that's gonna be really interesting to learn about how to support students with maths anxiety. Hands up if you are not a maths teacher. I'm not gonna put you on the spot. I'm just gonna remind you that you still need to know how to support your learners with maths anxiety because it affects everything. Um, the next presentation is going to be Michael Gibbon. He's going to be talking about scaling. And the third one is going to be with Joanne Kaminsky. who's going to be talking about getting students from across the world, which is jolly well useful so that you're not waiting until the kids come home from school so you can tutor. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you.
haven't seen your face for an hour or so. Yes. I've been listening quietly in the background. Skip leave. Well, quietly for me oh. in the background. I've typed <laughs> some stuff. I've just it's one of wow. those days. Wow, I got wow, wow. Suitcase. Cheryl, I haven't seen you for a long time, have I? What a treat to see you back here. Everything okay? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Joining, joining from the United States. <laughs> yes. The United States has woken. We've got, <laughs> we've got Michael and Joanne after this, for example. I know. Reasons. I have I have a meeting that I have to go to a local uh, event, and I just messaged Michael to tell him I was going to be in there, but I cannot join Joanne today. But Thanks for the invitation. I'm so glad I got to see this. You are always welcome here. Um, Cheryl, everything will be available to you um, this evening. Well, your midday on the uh, on the interactive festival guide because Hannah's cracked YouTube now. So okay. Thank you. Sharing. She's, yeah, it's all we, we, we've got it all going on here. So awesome. um, Rob, you have Cheryl in the States. You have Nicole in Australia. Blimey, Nicole, what time is it there? She's got her hoodie on. 11.30. And it's freezing. <laughs> and it's freezing. It's still, the <laughs> it's still winter in Australia. Um, so we're going to launch straight in because I've just taken two minutes of Rob's session, which was naughty. Welcome, Rob. Um, are you going to introduce yourself and explain your background? Yeah. And I'm going to zip it. Yeah. Okay. Shall I start? Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying thank you to Julia and the whole team at Love Tutoring for the opportunity to talk about maths anxiety and maths difficulties, because it's really underrepresented in, in the whole sort of field of education. And at the Dyscalculia Network, we're looking to change that. So I'm gonna change, I'm gonna share my screen now. Hopefully that'll work. Okay, is that all looking good? Okay, fantastic. So talk today is uh, supporting students with dyscalculia and maths anxiety. Um, it's uh, probably not enough time today. So if you want any more information after I finish talking, please get in touch with Julia's team and uh, she'll provide, send them send them notes on and we'll do what we can to help. Yeah. So the dyscalculia network was born about 2019. Uh, Kat Edel and I set it up. With a, uh, because we both, being math specialists, realised that there's just no representation for this special needs. And our aims are to raise awareness of dyscalculia, the math difficulties. Um, I had problems when I first started working with dyscalculia, saying the word. So I have a little trick that rhymes with Julia, dyscalculia. So that's a, just a little good visual hook for that. Uh, we also, via the website, provide the UK's only dyscalculia teaching and specialist assessing directory. You can put in your postcode and hopefully you'll find someone in your area to help you. The only trouble being, because it's, it's poorly represented, then there's uh, not enough assessors and not enough specialist teachers. So there may be black spots in the country, but get in touch if you need help and we'll see what we can do to help. We also provide information for parents, um, all sorts of educational professionals and anybody interested, especially adults, because uh, raising awareness means that people who have had dyscalculia for a long time in their lives and suffered, it means that they're uh, coming out of the, uh, uh, and getting in touch with saying, all of those conditions you talked about, that's me. Uh, we also are now regularly providing dyscalculia and, and maths difficulties training. So look on the website for any information on that. If you're a teacher, from, we do it online courses. So Australia, USA, you're more than welcome. Okay, so a bit of context. Uh, dyscalculia and maths difficulties affects about 6% of the population. Uh, that's probably about 5 million people. Uh, 4 million adults and 1 million pupils. So uh, recent studies have shown that it's so poorly represented. This is the study uh, from 2021, uh, where they looked at just over 2,500 people. Uh, 20, roughly a quarter required some sort of centre court, 
and 5% of that were diagnosed with dyslexia, but 0.04% was diagnosed with dyscalculia. And roughly the same numbers affect both conditions. And it's really badly represented on here. So you're 100 times, doing the maths, you're 100 times more likely to get diagnosed with dyslexia than you are with dyscalculia. And that's that shocking. What is dyscalculia? So dyscalculia is defined as a specific and persistent understanding of numbers. Then it can range, lead to a range of difficulties with mathematics. It occurs across all age groups, uh, different levels of education, uh, gender, and abilities. So it does really does across the board affect a wide range of people. And we, we classify maths difficulties as a kind of a continuous, a continuum line with dyscalculia firmly placed as the kind of end of that line. I love this kind of definition. You can download this definition of this uh, calculia from the Scottish Education website, it's free. Um, but it just, I love the graphics. I love the infographics. It gives you a, a list of some of the key indicators of maths difficulties, this calculia. Problems estimating, subitizing. Subitizing is the ability to count a small number of objects without, sorry, uh, to identify a small number of objects without actually counting them. You know, like mother duck will look around and see her three uh, ducklings behind her, but she wouldn't count them, but she'll know innately that that's, that's okay. People just don't really have trouble with subitizing, so it's one of the indicators here. There's also ordering and sequencing directionality. A lot of dys dyscalculic pupils will flip the digits. So the number two will end up looking like a number five and vice versa. Uh, everyday tasks involving money and time is a real problem for these students. But I think the most important part of this slide, if you like, is the impact of how it affects us as a barrier uh, varies in degree to the quality of learning and the teaching environment that we provide for them. So early intervention is always better and it helps us to sort of put in place the proper intervention. Just a couple of general factors which make maths hard to learn. Uh, it's quite an abstract topic. You know, what does area mean? What's the difference between area and volume? Unless we have something concrete that we can look at to see the difference between like a 2D shape and a 3D shape, it's quite, quite abstract. It's also complex, involving lots of different language. Uh, I don't know, understand why there's seven different words to mean add, add more than the total of, the sum of, you know, it just makes it more and more confusing. And it, there's an element of space in it as well. But I think the thing that really uh, affects how is the way the mass is taught in some schools very quickly. And there's a real emphasis, which I really dislike, is the emphasis on rote learning. You know, the Friday afternoon times table test how quickly you can answer 10 questions. You know, that's not a learning, of, it's not an understanding of your ability in maths. That's just a, a rote learning exercise. It's equivalent to say, learning the capital cities of Europe, you know, and asking what's the capital of France, you know, has no relevance to your understanding of geography per se. So we really are against uh, overloading people's working memory uh, and memory for when learning maths. Maths is a very building block subject, so it relies heavily on the foundations of maths, the key foundations like um, all the calculation skills, understanding of place value, understanding what the basic fractions uh, and decimals represent. So at the uh, Tiscalculi Network, we've come up with this concept called the Jenga effect. I'm sure everyone's played this fantastic game and I'm promoting uh, the game now, but um, we see maths as a really modular topic. And the kids and the adults that struggle with maths have had some of the foundation bricks taken away and placed on top. A lot of the intervention in schools is at the wrong level. If, for example, they might be struggling with fractions, then they're sent out and do, to do more fractions. Whereas there might be a, a more fundamental thing that's not working in say, for example, division skills 
but are not able to do uh, simplifying of, of basic numbers. So this Jenga tower with bits missing is what we classify as someone as a classic dyscalculic student. And what we try to do is to create a more structured and complete Jenga tower on the right hand side. So how can we provide this firm foundation to help with maths difficulties? So first of all, we have to look out for this, and that's the things we talked about with the Scottish definition. Look out for the indicators, subitizing, the inability to remember uh, calculation techniques, the reliance, over-reliance using of fingers, counting up and back in ones. Um, all of these things are indicators that we need to investigate further. The further investigation is an assessment to sort of find out the strengths and weaknesses of that individual, which we base our teaching intervention plan on. When, when we do the intervention with that individual, it's really important to sort of to put it at the correct level. Don't just uh, you know, go back to what they're sort of struggling with in the class. We need to go right back to the foundation areas because if they're not secure, they're gonna have knock on effects throughout that whole maths education. But what I would recommend is maybe even go back beyond that. So you start the lesson with something they can do. You'll be amazed at the effect of saying, well, my first lesson with you, and I've, I've been getting right answers, and I can do this stuff. It's a huge confidence boost for the individual that's been struggling and can't do stuff in class. So start with something that you're gonna build on, build on success. Scaffolding learning is really important as well. You know, trying to do as little steps as possible, and don't go on until you've really like cracked off for this. Uh, part of the mass learning that you're doing. So then just to summarize quickly here is that it needs to be understanding based, not rote learning. Use lots of concrete models because mass being really abstract, you have to use these models to prove what, what these are, what they work at. You know, a 10 is like 10 individual ones. And if you're using place value maths, then you can see categorically using concrete material so that's the value of 10. And if it's in the ones column or the units column, then it only has a value of one. So these are really important to use concrete material. You need to be very carefully structured. So there's, uh, for example, there's lots of pre-skills you need to do to successfully say, for example, teach times tables. You need to have an idea that multiplication is really step counting. So you're adding each step by whatever times table you're working in. And then you also can take away step counting. So that understanding that multiplication is like repeated addition and subtraction is really important. And so you have to sort of work on your addition and subtraction skills before you can then implement the program of understanding and working out the times table you need to do. Um, so that's kind of case of not allowing the children to learn by rote the times tables they can use things, for example, like the keys to the times tables. Because even when certain students understand multiplication is effectively step counting, the tendency is to start from the beginning. So if they have a question, say, for example, six times eight, they'll go one times eight, two times eight, and all the way. But that's six different calculations. So you're creating even more pressure on them to do that work, even though that they can understand where they can get to. Uh, a better way to do it is something which we call the keys to the times tables. And that's just three of the times tables in, in to working together. That's 10 times, 10 times eight is 80. Five times eight, five is half of 10. So that means half of 80 will be 40. And then two times eight or double eight, and that's 16. And then use those uh, if you like keystones to sort of move up and down the times tables to get to your answer. It's very reasoning based. It means they don't have to sort of remember things by rote and they can apply that and extend that. So you, you find that once they've got that, they can work at 11 times and even 12 times 13, because they're just adding on an eight each time and they don't have to go back to the beginning. Um, use language children understand. Um, encourage them by using maths games. We love maths games at the network and we try and do it as much as possible because it's a really good way of 
reinforcing teaching topics. And it's a good way of reducing the maths anxiety as well. Why play games? Uh, the, the learner doesn't realize they're learning. Uh, they're more productive. Uh, it helps them understand what numbers are. And I, I use them in particular as a really good way of reinforcing skills or topics you've just been working on together. There's loads of different games. And at the network, you can download free games on, from our blog. And if there's a particular topic you don't see on there, just write to us and then we'll get back to you with some ideas of what to do. But overall, the games are going to reduce the anxiety and improve the confidence of the learner. Maths anxiety is a huge topic in its own right. And before you get got any chance of helping with someone's maths education, you have to sort of deal with this maths anxiety. It's prevalent across the board. In latest studies of OECD countries, it could be as high as 25% of the population. You know, I, can, I wish I had a pound for every time you hear someone say, oh, don't worry about their maths. I've never been good at maths. What we're doing is uh, we're passing on that anxiety to our children. So the symptoms for maths anxiety can be physical and psychological. Um, nausea, shortness of breath, sweating. Um, we've all sort of uh, experienced the Friday afternoon um, stomach ache or can't go to school because they've got a mass test or whatever coming up. It's a, a symptom of mass anxiety. But also, also importantly, is the, uh, the negative self-talk, mass avoidance, the isolation, thinking they're the only ones that are not very good at mass. Uh, and all of these symptoms and negative mass attitudes lead to something called a, a cycle of failure, which kind of over time, it's not addressed, it's going to make things worse. Avoiding doing maths means that their preparations for the next lesson is going to be less, means the poor performance next time is even worse. And so it's a never ending cycle that we have to kind of break, make maths fun. We need to sort of, you know, all the things we were talking about before about the intervention to help. Uh, some idea of uh, numbers. Here we have uh, some latest stats. Uh, one in five parents that study for arithmophobia, fear of numbers. One in 10, eight to 13 year olds in Britain suffer from math anxiety. I mean, these are kind of, I think, conservative numbers, but they're sort of some of the latest research. I think people are a little bit, math is quite a unique topic. People are sort of reluctant to say that, you know, how, how actual scary maths is to them. So I think kind of these are the sort of the tip of the iceberg. So I've got some just some tips now in the classroom and what we can do at home to help. So I think the, the key is to early identification. We need to sort of, um, as soon as we spot someone that are exhibiting some of the uh, symptoms of anxiety uh, and problems with dyscalculia, we need to sort of uh, put them on the sort of register, look out, see what we can do. Look out for any of those physical signs of anxiety. We talked about the stomach ache and develop more grounding techniques to so sort of like breathing exercises or trying to sort of like introduce some more positive aspects of maths. And the way to do that is using sort of some growth mindset, some introducing some more positivity within that. Than, you know, the intervention at the right place, um, preparing for success, goes a long way to sort of change in this mindset. Um, we need to adjust our teaching styles, especially when we're teaching, for example, new topics. We need to be mindful that, you know, anything new out of the order is going to cause anxiety in some of our pupils. So it can be reintroduced, it can be introduced using it as a game, or we can spend a lot of time using the concrete materials. Uh, diagrams, etc. Uh, we need to uh, chunk, so we do small wins. There's no good trying to go too fast on a topic. Take your time. Revise and record vocabulary, so uh, we use a consistent use of the same language and language that the pupils used to. We said before as well, using concrete materials to sort of demonstrate how things work is really, really important. I think this is. Me as well, recognize maps is all around us. 
start to introduce examples from our daily lives. You know, we use money less these days, but you know, how far things are to the shop, how long it's going to take us to do something, how big something is, you know, all maths type questions. But the more we can introduce, the more normal it becomes. And like I said before, take away any pressure, not rote learning, it's not the way forward. And putting pressure to do something in a given time immediately it blank means they blank out and can't remember what they've been taught. So give them time to sort of come up with stuff about how it works. Uh, just a few tips about what we can do at home as well. Practice little and often. Uh, I think kind of this is kind of key here as well. Uh, we tend to, well, in my household, in the past, we used to sort of leave the homework to Sunday afternoon. It used to be a big rush to get everything done for Monday mornings and in time. But now we've introduced like uh, just before dinner, like just after dinner, we have 15 minutes going through a few key topics. And then you don't have to do something, you can just relax knowing that, you know, you don't have anything to do. Um, at home, you need to don't practice any, don't try and teach anything that's not been taught yet. It's, techniques are changing in schools all the time. So what I would recommend is you just work on the stuff as, as a kind of revision guide and reinforce stuff that's already been done. As we said in the classroom, maths is part of everyday life. The more you can introduce, the better. Make maths fun using games as much as possible. Talk about this before as well. Don't pass on any maths anxiety. I've never been any good at maths. It's not something to do because we're just lowering the expectations for the child and giving them the sort of, it's like lowering the bar so that they're not going to be able to do, uh, uh, try and put the effort in to do themselves. Again, like in all topics where there's anxiety, get them to talk about the anxiety. What is it? For, is it a particular teacher, particular class? Is it the topic base? You know, the more they open up, the more you'll get to the bottom of what's causing the anxiety. Um, I think teaching children to ask questions when they don't understand it. This applies to all topics, but it's really important because if you are struggling with a topic, especially maths, you're really going to be reluctant to ask questions. But I think in an open type environment, in a classroom and at home, I think that's really important. And as parents, communicate with your class teacher and so that we can all be seeing from the same like hymn sheet and communicate and doing things together in the same way, rather than clashing and doing a different technique or something like that. And remain calm. Uh, I've left it. As part of the slides, there's uh, three links here. There's the Maths Anxiety Trust, which is a fantastic organization set up to address issues with maths anxiety. And they've got lots of useful guides on the site. There's also uh, in Derby University, there's a Maths Anxiety Research Group with MUG. And they have really useful things there, uh, like sheets that can indicate how anxious you are now, so this actually scales. And there's also tips on the site as well to deal with it in the classroom and at home. And obviously through the Dyscalculia Network, here's our website, and you know, we've got lots of useful guides on here. And if you write to us, we'll definitely get back to you with some recommendations. Okay. And it's just, a, again, a huge thank you for, for being involved. This is really, Padre, en el nombre del Señor Jesucristo, Padre Celestial, Espíritu Santo, Marina. Señor Nuestro. Oh, I quite wanted to have a Spanish lesson then as well. Yeah. If there's any questions or anything. Come on, you guys, you got four minutes with Rob. And he's not tired at all. He's just taught an entire academy today. Oh, hi, um, I'll, I'll start off. How do you help in terms of stopping that reaction when you say, I'm not good at maths for a student and for maybe a parent? Well, when we talked about intervention, I think the key is to sort of uh, plan for success. So you need to sort of start some revision lessons on stuff they can do. And what you'll find is that it's so after being successful and getting stuff done. Uh, I also think less is more as well. You know, often children will go home and they'll have a sheet full of 50 questions. 
Well, you don't need to do that many. Maybe t 10 questions enough on a topic would be enough. It would enable them to complete the sheet. So a lot of the time, they're not able to do all 50 questions. You know, they're trying so hard to get some of them done. So if you were able to sort of set them less, cover the whole kind of topic, and they achieve that, then again, that's a success that will help them move on. Thank Super. You. I've got one as well. So my 15 year old um, has noticed that he doesn't mind maths. He just doesn't like the way that maths is taught in school. Yeah. And um, he, he really struggles with anxiety himself in general. And I think that there's something about the teaching of maths that is heavy, um, but also that is really um, details oriented in a way that doesn't suit him. Yeah. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the problem with maths, teaching is the teachers that go into teaching maths are passionate about maths and they are good teachers the people that get it but it, they, they, they don't really get and it's a big generalization and i don't want to do anyone a disservice but people that don't get it they're less connected with that sort of outcome and they're less able to be able to teach that sort of level in general um, and I think kind of uh, the, the focus of teaching from the board uh, in a rigorous type way is uh, not good for the people who struggle. They need to be able to sort of be involved, find some relevance about how it's affecting their life to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I, I wonder what the maths tutors in the room think about that, that when you're going and if you sign yourself up to be a maths teacher, you probably find maths manageable should we say well you love it too and, and that that passion comes across mm, oh, oh, oh so that's the flip side of it i certainly know that um as a primary tutor as a primary teacher i wasn't great at teaching maths because i didn't break it down into its smallest pieces i used to skip too quickly and i i, I could see when that when i lost them so i was always aware of that but also uh, the uh, teacher training uh, focus mainly on literacy. The, that's you know, right. It's hardly any uh, maths help support. And I wonder whether that's also to do with um, relying on the sequencing in the textbooks um, more in maths. Elaine and Cheryl, I want to hear your questions, but I'm not sure we're going to have time to answer them because Michael's just arrived. So can we hear the questions so that we can process them and mull on them? Would that be all right with you, Rob? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cheryl, go ahead. You know, um, I was also thinking the same thing about literacy, and I didn't know if anybody had a link or some sort of a, a curriculum. I had to walk out of the room for a minute. You might have missed it. I might have missed it. But is there a curriculum that um, is based specifically for dyscalculia students at the lower grades? I know you. I saw your tools. I was listening from the other room. Uh, but is there a specific curriculum that anybody has one, uh, but found? If, but if you look at Jane Emerson and Patricia Fabti's book, The Discalculia Solution, that tells you how to uh, teach children that struggle at the bottom end. I appreciate you repeating that. Thank you so much. It's called, it's called uh, The Discalculia Solution by okay. Jane Emerson and Patricia Fabti. It's like awesome. the Bible for teaching children that struggle. Oh, look at that, Helen. Thank you so much. And I used to use Ronnie Bird's book as well. Which is good. Oh, that's brilliant. And there's, she does some fantastic games. Yes. Uh, resources. That's right. Uh, that's right. But the, the basic fundamentals about helping with number sense and stuff. It's a good starting point. Awesome. Thank you. Is that all right, Cheryl? Great. Elaine, you put your hand down. Come on, bring it. Yeah, I was just going to ask really quickly if you had any tips. I've got a year, a girl in year 10 and she has possibly the worst maths anxiety I have ever seen. And she's already stressing about her maths GCSE in a year's time. And I want to, you know, help with her stress, but also, you know, how on earth am I going to get through this exam? I think kind of uh, the anxiety is affecting her maths performance, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe some maths games are aimed at that GCSE level would be really important. I think also um, it's what, what we're working with some pupils is their um, how they revise. Because uh, sometimes the textbooks within the maths curriculum at GCSE level are so thick and, and inaccessible, we need to do something about that. So 
we, we're doing some work on helping children that are at that struggling side to revise. There's lots of you can go to the shops and buy like these great revision guides, but they chunk, they fit so much onto even little pages. It doesn't really help someone that doesn't like clutter. I wonder whether um, some of the AI driven curriculum resources might be useful in that context, because then you yeah. can't see all the chapters ahead of you. Yeah. Okay, Rob, thank you so, so much for your contribution here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. Um, stick around. We would love to hear more from you and we would love for you to be part of our